I'd like to direct you for just a few moments to a couple of passages of Scripture. One of them is in Jeremiah chapter 9, and the other one is in Job chapter 33. We'll read those in Jeremiah 9 first, and then we'll kind of take those in Job chapter 33 along as we go through the sermon. But if you'd just take a few moments and look with me to Saint or, or to Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse number 23. I almost said St. John. I spoke four times out of St. John this evening, so I've got St. John on my mind. One of them, he is looking around there and he says, well, this don't say the same thing. And he said, this says First John, is that the same thing? I said, nope. Uh, First John and St. John, that's not the same writing. So back, back up there to that. We had a great victory today and it wouldn't mean nothing to anybody else probably, but there's been a gentleman there in the jail for about three months now. And he speaks no English, and he's about 50. And, I mean, he just wept every time he asked me. He said, yo quiero, vámonos por la casa mía. Yo quiero México. He wants to go home so bad. And every time before I left, he'd put his hands through the bars, and, and I'd pray for him. And he'd just ask God to help him as much as I could understand of what he was praying. Well, he was happy today. I seen him before he got to come out. He's back there combing his hair and everything. He got a big smile on his face, and he's going to get to go home in a month. And so he was so happy. And plus, uh, there, there's been several of the men in the jail that each time I, I would uh, speak, I would give them a little time to talk to him in Spanish. Several of them are real good interpreters. And they would, they would take of the word and help him step, step by, you know, and get enough of the gospel that he could have understanding of it. And we was in, in John chapter uh, 7 today where Jesus cried out with a loud voice. And he was talking about... Uh, if any man uh, thirst, let him come and, and be watered, and the, that uh, out of his belly would flow rivers of living water. And this he spake of the Holy Ghost. And so I got, to, I, try, I was trying to get him to understand, and, and I was talking to him in, in Spanish some too, that, that we understand uh, uh, the Father, which would be Padre, uh, and we understand the, the Cristo, which is the uh, Son. And we understand the Espiritu Santos, which would be the Holy Ghost. And I said, and, and of course, we, we talked about it in English, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. I said, if you can just get in your mind that, and, and one of them said, these three are one. I said, yeah, you're, that, that's there. They, they're one in unity, one in fellowship, one in cooperation. They work together to bring us hope and victory. And I said, Jesus is saying, I'm leaving. He had just told them before, and he said, I'm going somewhere that y'all can't go. And they're, they're looking at him. The Pharisees are looking at him and saying, where could he go? Is he going to go into the land of the Gentiles or something? Or another passage said, is he going to kill himself? Or, you know, he's going to go. But where he went was back to the Father. And guess what? They couldn't go, but he sends down. I told him, he said, he's, he's going to send the Holy Ghost down. Whenever he gets to the Father, he's going to send him back for us. And I said, that's what pricks your heart, brings conviction to you. And uh, they understand uh, being, a, uh, being convicted, but their conviction is with guilt. Whereas with Christ, it's not that way. Nearly all of them know or have heard John 3.16, but most of them don't understand what's spoken in John 3.17. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And I said, you may be guilty of what you did, but the condemnation is not laid on you from God. That comes from your own sin. He comes to set you free from that. Woo! Anyway, such a precious time. And here in this passage of scripture in uh, Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24, thus saith the who? The Lord. The Lord. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. So he's kind of cleaning house before he says, verse 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. What could be better in our life than knowing the Lord and understanding the, that knowledge of knowing Christ? That I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. And I, I love this part because people think that God's just looking down and waiting to just smack them and knock them off the face of the earth. But in truth, 
His delight is these three things. Would you say them with me? Loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for your precious love in our hearts. We praise you that you care. Thank you for this wonderful Mother's Day, Lord, for setting some time aside just to say uh, thank you for the moms. Lord, give them strength and guidance from this day forward, Lord. Nothing behind can be fixed. It can be forgiven, but we can go forward and we can be victorious. And we thank you for that. We praise you. Praise you for your word this evening. And would you bless with your anointing, Lord, these precious scriptures we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. These three things are so powerful. So I just want to speak to you from the thought. In these things I delight, saith the Lord. There's some stuff that you really like. We talked about this before, and Connie's not here, so I won't get a good whooping. But if you go to the women's closet, their, their closets are full of shoes. And you can go to the man's house, and he's got the stuff that men's like, guns or something. Uh, go to the pen, horses and stuff like that. I mean, we got all kinds of stuff. Trucks, uh, shells, or something out there. What, what do you like? Aaron, what do you like? <laughs> Just any, anything and everything, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I was, we was looking at some houses, and Aaron's like, I want to fix this thing up. You know, if, I, if it was mine, I would fix it. He loves fixing stuff up, making it look pretty. And uh, so that's, that's, that's good. Now, I was talking to Hagen, and Hagen's been working with his dad on his uh, gold cart. And so this has been about a, a six or eight month deal. And uh, the motor was locked up on, but they got the motor, and now the motor will run. They got the motor, so I've been trying to keep up with this, and because I, I know he, all he can think about is, <laughs> but there's just one thing still lacking is what I'm getting from Hagen. The tires ain't been fixed yet, and the tires are no good. Have you got them off? Yeah, <laughs> and so I told him the other day when I saw him, I said, "Hey, just bring that thing over to the house. I'll put some tires on the thing, and I'll ride it myself." <laughs> he laughed. Nah! <laughs> said, I ain't waited this long to get it. So there, everybody delights in something, but to know that God, that His delight is not in just wiping people off the face of the earth and just wham. Did you know? He, he even gives us some great insight when he says, when you see your enemy fall, don't rejoice about it. That's hard for us because we think they're getting what they deserve. Am, am I the only one like that? <clears throat> but the Lord's love relationship with mankind, that he has no pleasure, according to the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel, he says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It breaks his heart because Jesus died that everyone would have an opportunity to make things right. And so when somebody slips off into eternity that's lost, it's a heartbreak to him. You don't hear the angels rejoicing when somebody, however horrible they've been, because none of us had a hope of going to heaven without Christ. And so you can see why the joy and the victory and the love relationship is there whenever he talks about the things that, that really makes him happy. And he delights in these things. So I want to talk to you about that, and we're looking at just a little bit of Job here. But one of the first ones he talks about here is loving kindness. That's just one, that's almost a smothering word in it, that you love it so much you just can't, you just can't get enough of it. You've seen somebody eat something that they just can't just like. We was over at Brother Foster's the other day, and, and they cooked a, I mean, they had a bunch of chicken, which I was very, I could give that away to whoever likes it. But there on, but right beside it was a big platter of steak. Yeah. Wow, Brother Herschel, that's when you should have told the job, I can't work today. I got to go, I got to go have a good service, and I got to have some good groceries. Well, we all ate pretty good. Well, it tickled me. <laughs> Brother uh, uh, Lapison from uh, 
Seminole had preached our meeting, done, uh, done, done good. And uh, when he started to leave, he asked for a take home. And I mean, he had eaten till he, he was right, it was right there. And I mean, the, the, the chocolate, everything, he would, he would load it up, just waddling. But he said, could I? So he gets him one of them deals. <laughs> <laughs> and loads it up. And then he goes back and gets another and loads it up with that, with that uh, chocolate pie. <laughs> you know why? He was delighting and thinking, well, I've ate all I can right now, but I'm going to be hungry by night time. <laughs> How many of us like to eat real good? <laughs> We're kind of kin to that, aren't we? Can you imagine the Lord saying that he delights in loving kindness? I mean, we understand eating because we can't live without it. I mean, we just got to have some. <clears throat> but his goal is, I, I want to show you how much I love you. Woo! And you can't get Jesus on the cross without knowing his love for us because he went there for me, Amen. for my sins, for your sins. Whoa! And so for us to return that kind of love back toward him, that's an incredible, that's an incredible thought. Here in uh, Job chapter 33, it shows the loving kindness of the Lord dealing with humanity. And I've long time loved this passage, but if you'll just go along with us here. In Job chapter 33, we're going to start reading in verse number 13. Thank you girls for helping us with the gospel. I don't think I said anything about this morning, but thanks Sister Leatherwood for keeping us uh, abreast of the word, the scriptures here. Why doest thou strive against him so he's looking at mankind and man's way is just naturally against God because we are by nature sinners and so there's always a pushback from mankind so the Lord could just do us like he did in the sixth chapter or seventh chapter of, of Exodus or you no know, Genesis and just wipe the whole deal off with the flood that was a heartbreak to God why doest thou strive against him? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. For God speaketh once, yea, twice. Yet we're too deaf to hear. Would you say it with me? Too, too deaf. deaf to hear. How do you feel when you talk to somebody and you give them a long sentence and, and when they get through they look at you like, did you say something? <laughs> Christy, hit him. You can, you can go ahead, hit him right now. <laughs> And for us to do God like that, who, who are we to stand God up when he's talking? He said, God has spoken once and he's spoken twice, but man's just kind of dense sometimes. And so I would have to say, Danny is kind of dense sometimes, and I need to hear that voice clear. <clears throat> Verse number 14 or 15, yes. In a dream in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men in slumberings upon his bed. Isn't it neat that the Lord, we're, we're sleeping like crazy, but he's dealing with us. He said, I know how to get down to, because when you wake up, it's like, ooh, where'd that come from? <laughs> yeah. Then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instructions. You talk about love and kindness. He says, you're, you're, so, you're so given over to what you're doing that you don't have time. So while you're sleeping, I'm going to go to work on you. I want to work on your brain. I'm going to work on your thinking habit. And I'm going to give you some instructions sealed. I, I was talking to, I don't remember who, who it was. Oh, it was um, the gentleman that, that comes to church every once in a while. Uh, that, that you helped, Rebecca, that's down here in the apartments that walks to church every once in a while. I, I can't call his name right now. Leslie, yes. He, he said, he come to church, the last time he come, he, I said, well, I hadn't seen you in a while. He said, you know what? Brother Danny said, I just woke up from a dream or something. And he said, I felt like the Lord had just spoke to him. He said, you need to go to church today. And he said, I got up. He walked from the apartments over on 37th Street all the way to church. Isn't that precious? He just felt like the Lord spoke to him. I believe he did. The Lord cares. His loving kindness encompasses us. He wants to get a hold of us. He opened the ears of men and sealed their instructions that he may withdraw man from his purpose. We're so busy doing our thing that sometimes we don't hear what God's got to say. And so we're just going on, we're going to do our deal. And he wants to do something for us that's really important. He hides pride from man. What does pride do? Yeah, pride goeth before destruction. destruction. 
and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so here's the Lord loving on us through our dreams, talking to us once and twice. It comes two or three times until we, you know what? That's not just an accident. I know, I know God's talking to me. Yes. And uh, he says, he keeps back his soul from the pit. This is verse 18. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. I just think that's an incredible God that loves us so much when we're deaf and we can't hear him. He even works on us while we're sleeping. That is a precious Savior. So here's some attributes that we must covet. We want to covet the loving kindness of the Lord. In Psalms chapter 17 and verse number 7. Shew thy marvelous loving kindness. Oh, thou that savest by thy right hand, them that put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. Man, how many times does the Lord reach out if we'll just listen a little bit and he says, I'm gonna save you with my right hand. I'm gonna keep that from going through, going past you. He reaches out into our lives and speaks into our hearts. In Isaiah chapter 63, verse number seven, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. He said, I'm just going to make mention of what God does, how much he cares for people. Look at verse number nine. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Nobody but a loving Savior. Have you ever read after Israel where they were their ups and downs? Man, I mean, they're just like a basketball, just diving in and out. But the Lord is there the whole time putting his arms. And what's he doing with America? He's trying to save us. He loves us that much. He won't save us. We was having a, a rally here several years ago. And was, they had two or three of them. And they just got worse and worse. A, bike, a biker's rally here at the, down at the Coliseum. Y'all, y'all may remember them. And it, it grieved my heart because they just try and, you know, do outlandish things. And uh, I was praying about it. And anyway, we got a call on, on a Saturday when they was really doing the shindig out here. And... Uh, a guy said that he had some cattle out on 180 out and early at Gale. And I thought, man, what a time to be going. So anyway, we loaded our horses, man, Randy did, and we uh, went off out there. We was taking care of those cattle for Mickey Nell. And uh, we got out there and, and found the cattle and, and found a gate within, I don't know, a quarter of a mile of them, drove them back up there, put them in, and got, got the thing straightened out. And just as we was coming back out of there, here come a motorcycle over the hill, and it died right at the top of the hill, just coasted down there, probably not, I don't know, 200 yards from our trailer that was sitting on the side of the road. And I thought, aha. <laughs> there, may, there may be one man that was sent here by God. <laughs> And so I got to go talk to this guy that's sitting on the side of the road because his Harley won't run. And I said, well, I don't know if the Harley is dead or not, but I will tell you about a God that ain't, that he cares. And I said, you might have just stopped here just by the grace of God. I said, there's anything I could pray with you about, talk to you about, and come to find out he had been in church off and on, was kind of backslid, and I got to visit with him and, and pray with him about I thought, Lord... I'll probably never see the guy again or know him. He was trying to head back and there was somebody said, well, we'll, we would load your bike and take you with us. Or he said, no, there's somebody coming to get me. I'm going to stay here with it. But thank you. Thank you for the prayer. Thank you for the visitation. So you, you never know the loving kindness of God, how he wants to touch people's life. He cares and he's interested. I, I thought about the woman at the well. She was a little bit obnoxious toward Jesus. Do you remember what she said? Why are you a Jew talking to me? But here's the love and kindness of the Lord. He just keeps talking to her. And he, she doesn't know that he's bringing her right down to a crescendo. And all of a sudden, when she gets interested in the water, he says, well, if you'll go get your husband, I'll give you 
some of the water. And she just boldly says, I don't have a husband. Does he know that she's already had five husbands? Yes. Well, look at the love and kindness. <laughs> thou hast well said, thou hast no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. Don't you know she goes, ah! <laughs> And the man you're living with today is not your husband. And she said, I perceive thou art a prophet. <laughs> You know what she just recognized? Because he so gently loved on her, he brought her to a relationship with him. Woo! Isn't he wonderful? No, he didn't duck or dodge the sin problem. He brought it right out to the front, but he said, I've got a cure for it. Woo! She said, give me some of that water. Oh! And it's not but a few minutes later that she takes off to town and says, come see a man that told me all ever I did. Is not this the Christ? This is the loving Savior that reaches out into people's lives in the midnight, in their dreams, on the side of the road on 180, down by the well. Here comes Jesus to speak into those people's lives lives so precious you can't hardly read the book of Jonah without seeing the love of Christ man his love what's, he delights in loving kindness he hated what Nineveh stood for he hated what Nineveh was doing but he sent a preacher there that didn't want to come but he sent him anyway isn't it kind of neat how he lovingly guided Jonah through the whale's belly <laughs> over over to the bank of the ocean and says uh, would you like to go to Nineveh now? <laughs> and Jonah like wah! <laughs> I mean he gets to the edge and he, it's a three days journey through the he just he's preaching from one side of Nineveh to the other. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall fall. And he's mad when God doesn't destroy it. But here's the loving kindness of the Lord saying, hey, if you're mad over the worm and the little deal I give you for shade, what about all of those people? Yeah, what's he showing? He's showing that he delights in love and kindness. And what does he do with Nineveh? He forgives them. They repented. He forgave them. What the simple message that Christ has for us. I was talking to the guys today uh, out of John chapter 7 where it talks about he that doeth the will of God knows the doctrine of God. What is his doctrine? His doctrine is to do his will. Do right. And so I could tell the guys was kind of, it was like uh, eight or nine of them that had come out in, in uh, all together out of those three different tanks. And I said, okay, he, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get down and brother... <laughs> Brother Messick, he'll, he'll understand this. But I said, you've been driving on a flat tire. <laughs> and they looked at me like, I said, you know how that is, don't you? Kablunk, kablunk, kablunk. I said, you're not in jail just accidentally. There's a problem. And your tire won't be aired up. It's got to be changed. And that's what Jesus wants to do. He wants you to get out of your will into his will. Every once in a while, I think, oh, no. Brother Keith's going to have a wreck. I see these guys coming in. The sparks are coming off the tar. They're running about 30 miles an hour on the rim. The tar doesn't come off and everything. They're just, <laughs> boy, that's going to be a, a neat thing to be working on. Wow. Well, whenever we're away from God, here's the Lord. Says, I still love you. I still want to help you. I want to bring change in your life. And he says that he delights in his loving kindness. There's a thought here in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. Can somebody quote it to me? Romans 5, 8. Does he have love and kindness? Yeah. Toward who? Toward us. He wakes us up in the night. He speaks to us by the well on the side of the road. But God commendeth his love toward us. And then while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Woo! That was his delight. When you read Hebrews, what is it, chapter 10, and you get a look at why Jesus goes to the Calvary, and it says, for the joy that was set before him, the joy was the thought of releasing the prisoners. Yes, yes. Ah, woo! 
that they could be free from sin's nature, be free, born again, brand new. Wow, that's glorious. The second thing he talks about here in this passage in uh, Jeremiah chapter 24 no, chapter 9, verse 24, he said, I am the Lord which exerciseth love and kindness. And here's the next one. He is a God of judgment. He wants judgment to be right. He's so kind. I mean, he don't have to, he don't have to say, I, I'll help you out. Nothing. He don't have to say that. But he loves, he loves us and he wants us to get a correct opportunity if we can. Here in Job chapter 33, verse number 19, going on with this not only does he talk to us in the bed. Look at verse number 19. He chastened also this person or people from time to time. He chastened also with pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain. What happens when you start having physical problems? All of a sudden you go to say, you know what? I've done everything I can, but I still, I need some more help. Somebody pray for me. Why, why do we pray for people? Because the Lord is our great healer. He knows we have some physical problems, some aches and pains. I was talking to a boy just the other day, just had his knee replaced, his Bill Voskin. He, he said, man, he said, they took, they took that little uh, cap off of my knee when they replaced my, uh, my knee. And he said, that cap had all kinds of arthritis on. I said, you're just getting old. <laughs> he said, nah! He said, they scraped all that off and put something on there so that, that wouldn't rub right against that steel. I said, ooh. <laughs> Did you know the Lord knows that we have pains and trouble? We, we sing the song, I'm trading my sorrow, I'm trading my shame. Uh, I'm trading my pain off. I want to get rid of that stuff. Yes, why? Because the judgment of the Lord, he looks down on us. He, says, he chases us sometimes. He, he allows us to go through some troubled times where we can really get our things right with God. Look at verse number 20. So that his life abhorreth bread and his soul dainty meat. He said, I'm really not that hungry. I just want to get wet. <laughs> yeah. Woo! His judgment's good, isn't it? His flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave and his life to the destroyers. A person that's sick and not saved, he can go nowhere but hell unless somebody brings him the gospel. And so it, here's the Lord through his judgment, instead of just clipping him and saying, send him on out, look at the hope. If there be a messenger with him, and friends, that's where we're at as believers. Shouldn't there be somebody that goes and says, you know, the Lord loves you. He wants to help you. He's going to see you through this storm. There's victory. And his, his judgment is so precious. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand. So everybody that talks to people that's sick does not talk to them about their soul. But our business is, Lord, if you delight in judgment, help us to help that person recognize if they've missed, make a good judgment call and say, I'm wrong. And that's what repentance is all about. You judge your life. You look it over and say, I know he don't condemn me, but I need to get this fixed. And I'm going to go on from here and I'm going to get better at what I'm doing by the grace of God. And so if somebody shows him the Lord's uprightness, man, what a, what a precious opportunity. In 2 Kings chapter 19 and verse number 14, there's a real struggle in the kingdom. We talked about this just a little bit Wednesday night, but this is a precious time when Hezekiah, he's at his wits end. As far as humanly possible, there's no way they can whip the Syrian host or the Assyrian host. So Natureb has sent Rabshakeh, which is the captain of his host, and he's got a mouth on him like a motor scooter. I mean, he's, he's just cutting God. He's cutting the Israeli people. He's speaking in the Hebrew language. He's saying that, there, that never, not one God could stop the Assyrian host in any country they've come to. They've wiped them out. He named the kings that they've whipped and killed. And he said, don't let Hezekiah, they done take, they've already taken Israel. And all of Judah, the only city that's left standing is Jerusalem. And he said, this city is not going to stand and don't let Hezekiah tell you that it's going to stand because he ain't got no way to stop Sennacherib. And here, 
as this letter is handed to the king and he reads it, he goes to the house of God and here's where he takes this letter and puts it out before the Lord. I'm talking about God knows about judgment. He loves to judge righteously. He wants that. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before him. I just want to tell you, friends, whenever trouble has come, take it to the Lord and say, Lord, would you be the one that separates this the way you want it? Yes. And I want to tell you, God is going to do it the right way. He delights in love and kindness and he delights in judging the thing rightly. He knows the, the start, the end, the beginning, everything about it. And he's going he's gonna to bring it out in a good way if we just turn it over to his hands. So he prays. We don't have time to read the whole deal. He, he calls on God. And if you look on down to the verse number, let me see if I can find it. Verse number 32. There's a promise given to him. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. And don't, this took a while for this to happen, but don't you know he's shouting when he hears these words from Isaiah. He shall not come into this city. Boy, after he's been praying from 14 plumb down here to 32, here comes the answer. This God of judgment says, I'm going to do something. He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. They're not even going to put the ladders up to crawl over the top. Thus saith the Lord. Wow. I was telling the church Wednesday night, I hadn't read the story in a little bit. I said, the Lord took 85,000 lives, but there was more than that. Scroll on down to where it says what happened the next morning. Uh, it may be in verse 30. Uh, no, it's going to be past that. Uh, okay. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. He shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. Yeah, there it is. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote the camp of the Assyrians. Not 85,000, but look at it. 100, four scores. So a score is 20. So if you do four 20s, that's 80. 185,000. So when they arose early in the morning, not the corpses, but the Israelis, they got up and looked over the wall and guess what? There's 185,000 corpses laying around that city. Wow. In one day. Why? The Lord said, you can't, you can't curse the God of Israel, the real God, and get by with it. And he said, plus, Sennacherib is going to be killed in his own country. His, his own sons got, got him and, and uh, slaughtered him with the sword. Wow. The Lord delights in judgment. And friends, if you do right, God's on your side and he's going to judge your works against the works of the devil. He's going to help you. This word delight means to give great joy or pleasure. Highly pleased or the power of pleasing. Man, isn't that interesting that we could, if we would judge rightly, we could please the Lord in what we're doing. He loves, he delights in loving kindness. He delights in judgment. In Daniel chapter 3 the king is so mad. He's a, a, a world ruler. He's not the man of sin, but he has rulership like uncommon, unknown. And uh, in, under his hand is three Hebrew children. You remember their names? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And from all of the land in the world, all of the princes, the rulers, the sheriffs, all of the leaders of all of those lands have been called in to bow down before the golden image. And when the music is playing, everybody bows down except Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And I'm just talking about the God. He loves judgment. And so some of the tattletales, the snitches, they were looking around. And they go, to the, they go to the king and they said, oh king, did you know those three Hebrews that you got up there sitting there nearly leading this whole nation right under Daniel? They didn't bow. And so he says, bring them up here. So man, they, they brought up there and they said, now you may, have, you may not have understood, but when the music plays, you got to bow down with the rest of them. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, ooh, I love their, uh, what, what was it uh, in, our, in our class, brother Brother Leatherwood, in our men's meeting, they got some backbone. 
<laughs> that was the two things he talked about. Backbone and not, not dignity, but uh, integrity. Backbone and integrity. I love what come out of these men's lives. Young men, but the Bible says that they looked at the king and says, this is one thing that we're not careful to answer you about. Whatever you do, we are not going to bow to that idol. And God is going to deliver us out of your hands. But if he don't, we will, we're going to be delivered anyway, whatever happens. And so he heats the fire up. Remember how many times? Seven times hotter than it was wont to be heated. He gets his best men. The most uh, strongest, powerful, meanest. They gather them up. They tie, their, tie them together, tie their hands together. And in their clothes and all, they carry them up there and they throw them in the fiery furnace. The fire so hot, the song says that the men were slain. So does the Bible. That carried them on their way, killed the guys. The men fell down and they look around. And in this, in this need, here's this guy. I guess we showed them. And here's the judgment of God. All of a sudden, he looks in there and he said, <laughs> he calls the counselors over and said, hey, didn't we, didn't we throw three men in that fire bound? Yes, oh king, yes. They don't, they don't want to get in that fire. They're scared of it. He said, lo, I see four men and that fourth one is like the son of God. Isn't God's judgment so deep? I think he delighted in that. Woo! Did you know that the, the only thing that was gone was what bound them? They're free. Their clothes wouldn't burn. That was the first flame retardant material. <laughs> Done by the power of God. Woo! And they, he, he, call, he hollers, the king, Hey, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, come forth and come hither. Woo! They looked him over. Yeah, said, inspect them. <laughs> Listen, what? It didn't even burn their eyebrows. Wow. No, their eyelids are good. Everything is straight away. They looked at them where the ropes would burn off. No sores, no blisters, nothing. They smelt of them and said, they don't even have the smell of smoke. Woo, we're going to kill everybody that doesn't believe in the God. <laughs> don't you know the Lord is delighting in what these three. I, I love what Brother Clinton said one time. All God ever needed wherever you are is a man or woman that will stand up for God. He delights in judging the situation. And if you'll do right or I'll do right, the Lord come right along. And he'll make it, he'll make it work for you. Stand your ground and watch God. He delights in loving kindness. He delights in judgment. In Proverbs chapter 22, in verse number 22. Rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. If people's having a bad day, don't, don't get after them for it. Look what he says. For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoil them. Yeah, you know why? Because he loves judgment. He says, I'm going to make this right. You're not going to get by with that. Woo! Isn't he wonderful? I love him. He delights in that. And then thirdly, he says he delights in loving kindness and judgment. And back in 24 of Jeremiah chapter 9 and righteousness. Woo! This word delight, great joy, pleasure. This makes him happy to see this happen. And when I think of him delighting in righteousness, if you look back to Job, Job chapter 33, where we've been reading in verse number 24, <clears throat> this man that's been sick, that God's been loving on and trying to turn him away from his pride and where he's been, here comes the Lord with his word of righteousness. Somebody's told him about the Lord. There's been a messenger come to him. And then he is gracious unto him and say, deliver him from going down to the pit. I found a ransom. Man, the Lord loves the salvation of just one soul. I found a ransom for him. Look at, the, look at these next verses. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. Man, isn't that wonderful to get out of a bed of sickness and all of a sudden you feel good, you're well, you're going forward. Wow. He shall pray unto, 
What's he doing now? He's praying unto God and he will be favorable unto him and he shall see his face with joy for he will render unto man his righteousness. Friends, the Lord wants to show us I brought you through this troubled time for a reason. I showed you my glory, my willingness, my loving kindness. Now, while we're going, I want to show you the right way to go. You don't have to go back. One of the boys was talking to me. In fact, last week he was telling me, he said, uh, I, I, I live for God for a little bit. This was in the jail. And he said, then uh, I got out. I done, I done good for a little bit. And he said, then, then meth. He said, I got back on meth. And he said, I, I just couldn't kick it. And so I was thinking about that this week. And he come back out. So sweet. And so I said, I want to leave you with this thought. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13. Because you was, you was so honest last week and told the guys. And a bunch of those guys are on meth. I said, or have been on it. I said, look at what the Lord made a promise. And I said, you need to know the scripture. I said, you may already know it, but you need to bring it back up and use it against the devil. There is no temptation that's taken you except that which is common to man. I said, you're not the first one that, that meth has taken down. But I just want to tell you that there's another promise that says, but God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that that you are able but look at the promise. But will with the temptation also make a way of escape. You know why? Because he delights in righteousness. He delights in seeing us going away from wrong and turning toward what's right. Reading on down in Job, Job, 20, Job chapter 33 and verse number 27. <clears throat> He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which is right, and it profited me not. Sin is never good. No. He will deliver his soul from going to the pit, and his life shall see light. Friends, you talk about the love of God being shown here. He, he loves to take people that's so crooked like we've been and changing us and helping us get on the right side. And instead of bringing up our past every day, say, we're new creatures. The old things have passed away. Let's, get, let's go forward. Don't never let that old stuff come back and take you over. Lo, all these things work with God oftentimes with man and what's he doing it for to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of the living he doesn't want anybody to go to hell in fact the scripture says in Peter not willing that any perish but that all come to repentance so the first thing to do if you're in trouble is repent Get by it, get away from lostness and say, you know what? The Lord's been working on me. I'd rather get sick and get right with God and get over it than to live good and go to hell and to find out, oh, I, I wasn't sick, but man, I just missed, I was so busy with what I was doing. I didn't realize it was my own pride guessing me, but there I was. Now I'm eternally lost. No, no, he loves righteousness. He delights in righteousness. Satan's temptation had so destroyed fleshly man's ability to live without sin that when Jesus came, he was the personification of righteousness. And his testimony was that he never sinned. <laughs> tempted at every point, just like we've been tempted, yet without sin. When you look at uh, John chapter 8, there's 11 verses that talks about the woman caught in the very act of adultery. They drag this woman in right in the church service, right in front where Jesus is teaching and make mockery of her. And then they tell Jesus, you know what Moses said? This woman deserves to die. They got the rocks with them <clears throat> because Jesus told them, says, after, you know, remember, you tell them, you know, you this without sin, cast the first stone. <clears throat> they got the rocks with them. He can see that. He just, he doesn't say nothing. Isn't that incredible? Why? He loves righteousness. And so here they are. They, they're wanting him to go ahead and help, help be a part of killing this, this girl that's caught in an act of adultery. He stands up after they pressured him and pressured him. And he says, well, I'll tell you what. It, it, look, look at this act of righteousness. If you've, never, if you've never sinned, you be the first one to throw a rock at her. Man, isn't that powerful? Wow. 
And so he just stooped down, starts writing again, and he looked up and he could see feet moving. And they're going out of the church house. They're going out the door. The Bible says from the oldest, from the eldest unto the least. It's like, well, how can he say that to us? Because he delights in righteousness. He's still writing on the ground. He gets up and he looks and he says, woman, where, where are those not accusers? Don't you know he's laughing on the inside? Why? Because he delights. He delights in love and kindness. He delights in judgment. And he delights in righteousness. And I think, I was reading this one time, I was, I was really scowling the, the men that brought her. And they, I, I, I just hate the deal because they didn't bring the men too. And I, I felt like the Lord spoke to him and said that he loved them guys that left as much as he did the woman that got to leave. He wanted, he wanted them to see that I, I don't have no pleasure in you taking the law and trying. He was, they, they did this whole thing just to catch Jesus in a wrong. And because Jesus, they could tell he loved, he wanted to help everybody. He's healing the sick, cleansing the leper, raising the dead. Everything he's doing is giving, giving, giving. He said, now you're going to have to take this woman's life. We're going to make you. Because the law of Moses has spoken it. And now they're gone. And he's just there with the girl. And he says, where's all those, where's all those accusers? And she says, well, Lord, they just left. And here's his words. Can you see the smile on his face? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Wow. What a precious Jesus we have. He delights in those things. So if he delights in that, how much more should we be able to forgive people and let it go and let the past be out of the way? Forget it. If you get offended very often, there's something, there's a problem. Because, I mean, Jesus could hate us every day. Instead, he loves us and he delights in helping us get by ourselves. <laughs> so you can get over it. Woo! <laughs> in his shouting ground. Yeah, I love that old song that says, we're saved to sin no more. This is in uh, the 29th. This is page 29 in the, in the melodies of praise. And there's five verses in the middle verse says, this fountain filled with blood and it's there to save us where we'll sin no more. Isn't that precious that it got into a song? I, it may have come from John chapter 8. Go, I don't condemn you. Just go and get out of the sin and business. Why? He delights in righteousness. In Isaiah chapter 4 and verse, or no, chapter 41, Isaiah chapter 41 and verse number 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee. How? With the right hand of my righteousness. Wow. It doesn't give us a story of where this, this lady went to. But I, I could say her, her time with Christ would be memorable forever. How many remembers when Jesus saved you? And forgave you. Isn't that a wonderful thing to go back to? Woo. That old song, when I was a kid, they said, I can tell you now the time, and I can take you to the place where the Lord saved me by his wonderful grace. Woo. So precious to remember those times that God corrected us, straightened us up, we got by our trouble. Man, the joy of the Lord became our strength and hope. Here in, in Isaiah chapter, I think this is 59 and verse number 16. It may be 58. Uh, I'll have to see when I see the. That's it. It is 59. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Why? He wants us to be like him. Where's there somebody that prays for other people? That should be us, isn't it? Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness. It sustained him. Look at the next verse, verse number 17. For he put righteousness as a breastplate. And an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance. His vengeance is against sin. And it's for the people. <laughs> Clothing and it's clad with the zeal as a cloak. He is a zealous God to help us to the uttermost. And then in closing, this is Amos chapter 5 and verse number 24. These are the things that the Lord delights in. Love and kindness, judgment and righteousness. And here it is. In Amos chapter 5 and verse number 24, would you like to stand together? (laughs) 
Let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. He wants there to be a lot of it. Wow. And that's the way he pours it out toward us, toward mankind. Through his love and kindness, his judgment, and in his righteousness, he wants to reach us and say, I delight in doing these things in your life and making it right. And there's not a greater joy this side of heaven than being a part of his love and kindness and his judgment and his righteousness and seeing that manifested in your walk. And I'd like for you to come in this evening and just spend some time saying, Lord, if you delight in that, I want to be a part of the thing that you delight in. I know he hates sin, but I know he loves righteousness and love and kindness. Would you come this evening and let the Lord just speak into your heart in a very precious way.